White with you with the first of several lessons on stalls and spins. Let's do a little bit of review. Lately we've been talking a lot about angle of attack of an airfoil. And as you recall, the angle of attack is the angle created by the cord line, which runs from our leading edge to our trailing edge, and the relative wind. Now, the air going over the top of the airfoil has to speed up because it is a, of a longer distance on the top than on the bottom. And according to Bernoulli's principle, when a fluid increases in speed, pressure decreases. And so we get that pressure differential which gives us lift. As we increase the angle of attack, we get increased lift. But at a certain point, what we call the critical angle of attack, we rapidly lose lift. What happens is, is the airflow going over the top of the wing separates and it'll, it'll trail above the wing and what will happen is, is air here will start to circulate back in like that. So you can see from this diagram that this air is actually slowing down. It's actually even stopping relative to the, to the uh, wing itself. So what happens is, this air has slowed down, what happens? The pressure increases, so we lose our lift. So when we reach that critical angle of attack, the wing will stall. And basically a stall is a rapid decrease in lift caused by the separation of airflow from the wing surface, brought on by exceeding the critical angle of attack. Now, a stall can occur at any pitch, attitude, or airspeed. That's an important concept to remember. However, the, air, the uh, wing will always stall at the same critical angle of attack, regardless of the weight, regardless of the air speed, regardless of how it's configured, that, that when that wing hits that critical angle of attack, it will stall. Now, another point to remember is that when a wing stalls, that does not mean that there is no more lift. The wing still is producing some lift, just not enough lift to overcome the weight. Take a look at this short video on what happens when an airplane stalls. Here we are flying along in our Cessna 172. I've pulled the power back, slowing the aircraft down, and what we'll do is just keep it level. So I'm having to pull back on the uh, yoke. To, uh, to do that. Now th that will increase the angle of attack as the airplane slows down and the angle of attack will continue to increase until it finally reaches the critical angle of attack. When it exceeds the critical angle of attack the airplane will stall. Now an airplane can be stalled at any airspeed in any flight attitude and it will always stall at the same critical angle for that particular aircraft. So this one might stall at 20 uh, degrees, another one might stall at 16, but it will always be the same angle of attack, uh, critical angle of attack for a stall. Now another thing that we want to talk about today is a spin, and a spin is basically an aggravated stall where the airplane will end up descending in a, in a corkscrew manner. Now you can imagine what would happen if you're in clouds, you can't see outside, you inadvertently stall the airplane, and then you get into a spin. That could be very disorienting. Let's take a look at this video of a spin. The angle of attack is increased until the critical angle is reached, at which time both wings stall. In order for an aircraft to spin, it must first be in a stall condition. Not partially stalled, but stalled. Let's take a look at it from the outside. Here we reach the critical angle of attack, the airplane stalls. What causes the spin is that one wing is less stalled than the other, in this case the right wing. Both wings, however, are stalled. Fortunately for your private pilot uh, license, you don't have to do a spin. If you uh, go on to get your instructor's license, you will need to, I think, do a th uh, three revolutions in a spin before you recover. Aviators, there's one final point that I want to cover today in our lessons on stalls. The air becomes thinner the higher our altitude is. For instance, if we're flying along at a thousand feet above the ground, at a hundred knots, we have a certain amount of air 
flowing past the wing that creates a certain amount of lift. So if we go up to 30,000 feet at that same 100 knots, we have a whole lot less of air molecules blowing past the wing. So we're actually creating a whole lot less lift keeping that same 100 knots. So what this means is that the speed at which the airplane will stall will actually increase the higher up we go because we have less air flowing over the, the airfoil. Now, you know we have the pitot tube on the, uh, on the airplane. For those of you who have done pre-flights, you always check to make sure that, that this is clear. Well, our airspeed indicator in the aircraft is operated, uh, it measures the, the impact of the air going into that tube. So when you think about that, the higher up we go, there is less air that's impacting into the pitot tube. So what happens is, is our indicated airspeed is actually less than our true airspeed as we go up in altitude. So here's the point that I want you to get today. An aircraft in any given configuration will always stall at the same indicated airspeed, regardless of altitude, because the airspeed indicator is directly related to air density. So even though the airplane will stall at a higher true airspeed, it will always stall at the same indicated airspeed that you see on the instrument, assuming that it's in the same configuration. Now, configuration, what does that mean? Let's say that it's the flaps are down. In that configuration, at a, at a, if the airplane stalls at uh, indicated airspeed of 55 knots at 1,000 feet, when you get up into the thinner air at, say, 30,000 feet, the aircraft will still stall at an indicated airspeed of 55 knots. However, the true airspeed will be higher than that. And in a future lesson, we'll really look at the airspeed indicator and all of the other airspeeds that there are out there. There are several that we're going to have to learn about. Uh, but for now, fly safe.